Welcome to the C-Suite Series, presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble's an SEC-registered, FINRA-licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. Today's interview features Cutagenics, OTCQB ticker symbol CHNXF. Noble Senior Research Analyst Greg Aron interviews Cutagenics CEO Phil Deschamps. Visit ChannelCheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on Kytogenics, all at no cost. And now, here's Greg and Phil. Hello, my name is Greg Arrand. I'm Senior Research Analyst at Noble Capital Markets. Uh, we are visiting with Phil Deschamps, CEO of Kytogenics. Kytogenics is a clinical stage company focused on regenerative medicine, principally in soft tissue surgeries. Its lead clinical product is Ortho R in rotator cuff repairs. Uh, good day, Phil, and, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, it's very nice to be with you. Phil, let's let's get a little bit about your background. You have an extensive background in life sciences and in developing innovative healthcare companies. Can you share your background and and, and also relate it to where you are now at Kyogenics? Sure. Uh, it's uh, hard to believe that I've been doing anything professionally for 36 years, uh, but that uh, that is the case. Uh, uh, I have been in the uh, healthcare industry all that time. Um, the most relevant uh, to your audience is uh, certainly uh, my leadership roles, and, and I've been the CEO of uh, four uh, separate uh, healthcare organizations pretty much throughout the gamut. Uh, I founded my own uh, neurology company uh, back in 2011. I ran a uh, services company for uh, 13 years at uh, GSW Worldwide. I ran a private, uh, a pri a private equity uh, held uh, company for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, and now I uh, I joined uh, Kytogenics uh, about, uh, well, it was ortho regenerative technologies when I joined, but uh, about a month and a half ago, we changed the name and I'm sure we're gonna get into uh, to, to why that happened. Uh, the most relevant experience, uh, Greg, uh, is uh, uh, that uh, that I have is is I have uh, taken uh, the company that I founded uh, with my partner uh, Jonathan Sackier, uh, who I also partnered with in this uh, in this case, and we'll describe that in a few minutes. Um, is uh, that I have uh, raised about a hundred million dollars uh, in the capital markets and sort of migrated the companies through the Canadian Securities Exchange, uh, through the uh, the big board in, in Toronto. Uh, the TSX and then on to NASDAQ. And that's pretty much the uh, the, the path uh, that this company is on. Uh, so I get to relive uh, some of the mistakes that I made in the past and uh, and use that experience to try and avoid them as I go through them this time. <laughs> so, so that's it for me. Experience is a great teacher, Phil, no doubt. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the company used to be known as Ortho Regenerative Technologies, but recently expanded its mission and changed its identity to Kytogenics. For those a little bit unfamiliar with Kytogenics and the recent changes, can you tell us how the changes better reflect the company's values and core competencies? Uh, you know, I don't know what it is about human nature that uh, that always requires the uh, the Model T to be invented before the Thunderbird. Uh, it's just sort of how you uh, how you sort of progress in uh, in your thinking. Uh, and any new CEO comes into an organization and the first task is to sort of get oriented about uh, where uh, where the company is. And for me, uh, it's actually kind of nice to, to be talking to your audience because I can take you through what was going through my mind when I chose to take this position six months ago and how it evolved to, to where we are today. So that's essentially the source of your question. Um, uh, back then, it was really important. As you mentioned, we were uh, an orthopedics focused company, uh, soft tissue in the orthopedics world. Uh, and at the time, it was really important for us to uh, to get the infrastructure of our clinical trial uh, ready. Uh, so we had 10 sites in the U.S., uh, really uh, the who's who of the surgery world, uh, and uh, but none of them were contracted yet. So the first uh, couple of months was uh, was to focus on that and get that project up and running. And I was very proud. I'm very proud to report that uh, nine of the 10 sites are now fully operational and recruiting patients uh, for for that trial. Uh, then, uh, then it was uh, kind of interesting. Uh, I was able to uh, to bring my my partner Jonathan Sackier, uh, who uh, who is a uh, I know we're going to talk about our, our team in a, in a couple of seconds here, uh, but Jonathan is a, is a surgeon and uh, and uh, he was very instrumental in in uh, in sort of the evolution of the company into from ortho to to kinogenics because his thought was wow. You know what we have here is a, a combination product that helps deliver a biologic. Uh, so you're platelet-rich plasma, 
uh, to uh, the soft tissue, uh, and uh, and soft tissue are things like tendons and uh, and uh, 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 tendons, ligaments, and things like that. Uh, and it has a quality of being sticky uh, and allow uh, the uh, the biologic or the blood in this case or, or platelet rich plasma part of the blood uh, to be sticky in uh, in where you put it. Uh, so um, he said, wow, there's a whole bunch of other potential indications uh, that uh, that this uh, this may be interesting for. And rather than being the destination, uh, the orthopedics being the destination, I wonder if it might uh, not be a really cool proof of concept, uh, but uh, to then sort of jumpstart the company into several other uh, potential uh, potential paths. Uh, so uh, that was really the right. idea that uh, brought us to, uh, to change the name of the organization uh, to Kytogenics. Uh, Kaido meaning Kaidazan base, uh, Genix is sort of the play on uh, regenerative medicine, and uh, and uh, I think uh, it's been really interesting to see people's reaction, and uh, and thus far the kind of attention that we've attracted was exactly the kind we, we were looking for. Well, Phil, as you suggested, mentioning Jonathan Sackier's name, uh, companies grow not just due to the technologies involved, but because of the people involved. Can you give a little more background about your leadership team, including Jonathan? Jonathan Sackier and I are uh, first and foremost uh, friends uh, and business colleagues. So out of the four CEO ships I described before, uh, he's been part of three of them. Uh, and uh, and we do that because we uh, we think differently and we augment each other's ideas. And, and it's so funny because this time uh, this is about surgery and it's about uh, uh, sort of something that he is uh, is he he knows everything about. He's been a surgeon for 30 years stopped performing surgery about um, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and throughout his career as a surgeon, he invented 15 of his own uh, surgical inventions and, uh, and actually brought them through the regulatory process uh, and, uh, and then licensed them uh, to other companies. And, uh, and it's exactly uh, the, uh, the business plan that we want to build for, for Kytogenics. Uh, so John, Jonathan has really been in, instrumental, uh, and uh, most people, if you go and Google him, you will note uh, that he was uh, one of the, uh, the 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 original inventors of the uh, uh, the Aesop's uh, surgical robot system that today is the Da Vinci system. So uh, intuitive uh, medicine has his fingerprints all over it. Uh, so he's a, he's a very well known surgeon. Uh, he's much more humble than that. He would never go into that detail, but uh, but he's a he's a rock star. Um, secondly, uh, I also work uh, with uh, Luc Meville. Uh, Luc is, uh, is a, an accomplished uh, CFO, uh, and that's the, the core team. Uh, and we've built, the, we've built the team to be um, uh, with uh, a, a very tight relationship with uh, the Montreal Polytechnic University. Uh, and that's really important to your viewers because ultimately uh, the environment in Canada for uh, this stage development company is really excellent. Uh, because there are a whole bunch of grants that we can take advantage uh, that are uh, public, uh, meaning the education system and uh, and the private sector get together, and there are grants to be able to foster industry uh, in Canada, uh, and uh, and that team has been uh, together for almost 22 years uh, in building uh, Kaidazan as a delivery system. Uh, so they are full time for us. We pay them on a variable cost basis, but uh, that's the core team uh, here. So we have a great, great science team uh, led by Jonathan uh, that ultimately uh, helps us do all of the chemistry experiments that we need to do at this stage of development and work with the FDA and the regulators. Uh, Luke, uh, make sure that we have the money to, to, uh, to fund everything. And he's just a wonderful brain uh, to throw ideas off. Uh, and of course, Jonathan and I, as I mentioned, uh, he was my co-founder of our neurology company together, which we both exited uh, back in, in August 2020. Yeah, quite the team, uh, Phil. Um, let's talk a little bit more detail about the technology itself, though. Um, you mentioned Kytozan. Obviously, the company's name is Kytogenics. Um, for those unfamiliar with Kytozan, what, what is Kytozan? Uh, and what's the value add or benefit when utilizing it with soft tissue surgeries? Sure. Uh, I, well, one of the things that will be perhaps surprising to your audience is I, I can almost guarantee that uh, each and every one of you watching this video has ingested Kytozan before uh, because Kytozan is a very, very popular uh, excipient in uh, many supplements, uh, food products, agriculture. Um, there's also a a, a, a part of, uh, of uh, the Kaizen market that is uh, called medical grade Kaizen. And so that ultimately is, is what we're using. 
And uh, the scientists at the Polytechnique, uh, Tritazan has a very, um, a very uh, interesting profile uh, in that it's mucoadhesive, so it sticks to tissue. Uh, and it's also, uh, here's a cationic, so that's a sort of a scientific word, it just means that it has a positive charge uh, on the molecule. And most of the tissue in your body are negatively charged. Uh, so that adds to its stickiness. So when the Polytechnic uh, started doing this research uh, way back in, uh, in the early not years, uh, you know, 2002, 2003, uh, they said, wow, this, this may be a really good uh, system to transport uh, molecules. And originally, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Kytazan was designed to be a, a thermogel uh, that uh, oddly, uh, you know, most things when they get warm, they get, they get more loose. Uh, but this thermogel is actually more loose at room temperature. And then when you bring it up to 37 degrees C or 98.6, uh, it actually uh, jellifies. Uh, so these are all uh, qualities that they wanted to put in place. And they figured, wow, uh, the, the body's repair system is fundamentally based uh, by blood, right? Uh, and, uh, and so their idea was if we take uh, about 10% of the blood is called platelet-rich plasma, and you, would, you, you get platelet-rich plasma by simply centrifuging your blood, uh, and, uh, and then you, you, you can extract uh, the, uh, the PRP or platelet-rich plasma. And, uh, and so the idea here is in that platelet-rich plasma, there's all of the regenerative medicine uh, part of the body sort of in, is is in that uh, is in that part of the blood, and uh, the the proof of that is essentially you know if any uh, if any of you viewers have ever cut themselves, uh, deep enough cut that uh, that you go so, you go through the skin. Well, what happens is uh, you know within about four or four to six weeks or so, a scab will form, and then uh, the three layers of skin will be repaired, uh, and then if you've nicked a, a nerve or or whatever else uh, inside, it will also be repaired. So, so that is exactly what uh, what they're doing. The problem with PRP or that some part of blood is it's almost as liquid as water. Uh, and so when you put it in to the, uh, to the body, so if you're doing a shoulder cuff repair and, and you put the, uh, the PRP in, unfortunately, it would just leak away. It would have some, uh, some beneficial effect, uh, but then leaks away. In fact, my brother is a, uh, is a ranked tennis player in Quebec, and, uh, and he, uh, he mostly plays his tournaments on, uh, on, uh, on Saturdays. So on Friday, he goes and has his PRP injection into his, uh, in his tennis elbow. Uh, plays his tournament on Saturday, uh, and then on Sunday he can't even hold up a beer can uh, because it's it's sort of gone. So that's the that's the problem that uh, that the scientists were trying to solve. And so by mixing the chitosan that's sticky to tissue with the repair system, and you bring these two parts together, and it creates a, and here's a scientific term it creates a goop uh, that you can actually inject in uh, right on top of the repair, uh, and then it stays rather than 24 hours, it stays four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. That's about as long as it takes to repair, right? As, as we just explained. So the combination of those two things sitting on the repair uh, is the uh, is the idea here that then uh, the tissue regenerates, uh, and uh, and then the uh, the patient is uh, is left with a much better repair. Uh, so um, you know, there's about six hundred thousand of those surgeries, uh, Greg, that take place every day just on the shoulder. The meniscus, the part of your knee, uh, that the sort of the shock absorber in the middle of your knee, uh, that tears also frequently about 700,000 surgeries. And then a little $10 word, tendinopathies, uh, which just means tennis elbows or overuse injuries. There's about 11 million of those treated every year. Uh, and, and that's the market originally that we were uh, really focused on as the ortho-regenerative uh, technology. Uh, so that's how the technology works, uh, and uh, and uh, and now that we've evolved uh, the uh, the uh, the idea and the positioning of the organization, um, uh, we've uh, we think we can expand and uh, and build the uh, uh, the company much further uh, on that platform. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, it's a big market rotator cuff repairs. There's a high failure rate, as I understand it. And you're in phase one, phase two, status four, ortho R in rotator cuff repairs. Can you explain mm -hmm. what data points should be forthcoming and what you hope to see from those results? Yeah. So uh, for those of you who are uh, who are familiar with uh, with healthcare stories, there's basically three phases of any kind of development. And the combination of our kytazan and the PRP is called a, uh, a, a drug biologic combination. So it goes through the FDA biologics process. Uh, and that's a, it's phase one, phase two, phase three. 
uh, luckily for for us, when we got uh, our uh, our license from uh, from FDA to do the human study, uh, they basically said, "Look, uh, here is uh, kitazan, and kind of kitazan is generally agreed to as safe." Platelet-rich plasma is straight from the patient's blood, uh, so uh, own blood, uh, so that's you know safe to put back together. So really, what they were asking in their phase one work, so to figure out uh, the safety side, uh, is is can you can you reconstitute those two things safely, meaning without injecting what's called endotoxins or bile uh, or bacteria or anything like that. So what they do is they combine the phase one, two program in our case. And they said, look, guys, all we need to solve here is to, is to see whether it, uh, it's, uh, it's safe to reconstitute. And then we can see whether there's a signal. Uh, and that's what the phase two work is designed to do, is to give some kind of an efficacy signal. It doesn't need to be statistically significant or anything like that, but you've got to have a reason to, to want to pursue research. So that's what we're into. Uh, and uh, and uh, we're uh, closing in on uh, the first safety phase of the study, uh, which was this uh, phase where we had to do one patient at a time and have the data safety monitoring board uh, report uh, by patient uh, that uh, no infection was formed or anything like that. We're, uh, we're, uh, just, uh, uh, we're just about finished that portion. That's a big deal because once we finish that first part of the safety, you know, because the study is all about safety, uh, of course, but this first part of the safety is a really important milestone for us to reach. And, and I hope to announce to your viewers uh, in the next uh, week or so that, uh, that we're through that, uh, that period. The reason that that's really important for us is then after that, we can recruit patients, what's called on a parallel basis. So now we have to go one patient a week, uh, no more than one patient a week. And uh, now we can have all uh, uh, nine of the 10 sites that are uh, that are active to recruit on a parallel basis. So it makes and accelerates the program uh, tremendously. Uh, and it also sort of gives a, a seal of, a, of approval that this first, this initial safety phase is, is also over. Uh, so that's a, a really important, uh, uh, really important uh, first milestone on the clinical side for us to get over. Excellent, excellent indeed. Uh, you also just moved into a preclinical status for meniscus repairs, uh, a cartilage with a high failure rate also um, in the marketplace. Uh, you mentioned earlier utilizing grant funding to advance clinical programs. Is that the case here? Uh, and what data points can be expected for this? this uh this uh, trial program trial program it, indeed it is uh greg so this is another uh, just uh, sort of the second uh, incarnation of of the strategy here uh so we did obtain a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant uh to do the meniscus work uh and uh and that uh, surgery will actually be performed the surgery on the uh, this will be sheep the same uh, the same uh, cohort that we did with uh, uh with the rotator cuff to get our ind um and then uh, it will be uh, 20, uh, 20 sheep uh, on November 19th. And uh, November 19th, the surgeries will take place. There's about a four month uh, follow up to make sure that uh, the, the studies, the studies, the, um, uh, the sheep uh, are, are healthy and, and, all of the, uh, and all of the normal things that you would want to measure in these, uh, in, these initial, uh, in these initial like studies. And we fully expect that the meniscus uh, is fundamentally the same kind of tissue, uh, but it has to be uh, proven otherwise. So, uh, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll complete that work uh, fairly soon. And that'll add uh, to, the, uh, to the proof of concept that we'd like to, uh, to make sure that we implement uh, for, for future studies. Well, given your expanded mission, uh, what other potential market opportunities might be coming for the platform? You mentioned expanded you know, vision, so to speak. Uh, for instance, you recently announced a, a memorandum of understanding with the California Medical Innovations Institute. Uh, what are the benefits here of collaborating with the Institute? Um, secondly to that, um, are you considering partnership arrangements for other indications then? And if so, how will these be funded? Yeah, so uh, you know, when you're you get good at something, it's uh, it's good to rinse, repeat, and uh, do all over again. And so, uh, so thanks for the question. I think this is this is really where, uh, as I as I mentioned, the sort of the Model T to uh, to Thunderbird question, because Jonathan's observation was, wow, there, there's a lot of things that uh, that we could uh, actually help solve. Um, there's a, an enormous uh, medical need. So, so think about. Um, 
uh, the first one of the first project in fact we launched this product uh, this project just last week uh, again with the polytechnic so this is not uh, referring straight to the, uh, the the california medical research institute but i'll get back to that in a second so the first uh, real experiment was uh, with an organization and we'll be uh, naming the organization we're just finalizing the negotiation now uh, but uh, they are uh, interested in trying to uh, find better treatments for glioblastoma uh, so uh, brain cancer uh, vexing brain cancer. Pretty much everyone who gets that cancer dies uh, within about 14 months. Uh, and, uh, and the issue is that once you excise the tumor, there's always these little micro tumor cells that stay, uh, stay in the uh, right around the excision uh, or the hole that was created by the incision. And those eventually proliferate and cause a recurrence of the cancer. And so the idea here uh, is, and it, that's been tried, is to try and sort of raise the uh, uh, raise the uh, concentration of uh, of chemotherapeutic agents. But of course, everyone knows that those are toxic, so you can't get to that critical concentration to be able to kill those cells if you give it systematic uh, systematically. So the idea is, can we mix that uh, chemotherapeutic agents with the goop, and literally? fill the cavity with the goop so that it can deliver the chemotherapeutic agent locally. And, uh, and so now we've, uh, we've begun that work uh, to uh, verify that uh, they're both hydrophilic, meaning that they're both based in water. So they can, we, we think from a chemistry standpoint, they'll actually mix. And once we determine that, we're going to pursue, uh, we're going to pursue that as, a, as an opportunity. Um, Organizations like the California Medical Research Institute are uh, very similar to the relationship we have with Polytechnic. They are grant machines. Uh, in fact, uh, that organization is a private organization that lives off the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the fees, uh, the administration fees of, of the grants that they uh, that they get. So they've they've already gotten over a hundred million dollars in grants. And it turns out that uh, my my buddy Jonathan is very good friends with the owner of that organization. Uh, Gassan uh, Gassan is uh, Kalab is is the name of the of the person. And so we're going to do uh, some uh, some exploratory work with them. Uh, again, uh, Jonathan is a colorectal surgeon by trade. So what happens when you uh, when you resect the part of the bowel? You have to cut off the part that you don't want anymore, and then you have to tie them back together again. And in about 5% of times when you suture them, uh, those sutures leak. And then it leaks uh, really nasty stuff into the bowel, uh, into the cavity, uh, and 50% uh, and of the people die. And so the idea would be to take our, our Kytazan uh, PRP combination and after you put the sutures in, essentially coat it uh, with the repair system to stop the leaks from, from happening in the first place. So that is a, uh, th these are called uh, in the industry sort of never events. Uh, so no insurance company covers you for those because those sutures shouldn't leak, so to speak. Uh, so they're a huge cost and drain to the system, not, not, uh, not only uh, obviously from a cost standpoint, but uh, the morbidity and mortality is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is a horrible thing. Uh, so, so those are the types of organizations or the types of projects that we're going to, to, be, to be able to use now the orthopedic indications as the proof of concept and then get on with these kinds of, uh, of roles. So the new positioning of kytogenics is really about being a quintessential uh, uh, regenerative medicine delivery system to the body tissues. Uh, and just to give your audience a flavor of the size and scale of this uh, of this market, Greg is uh, is quite astounding, uh, and it's quite surprising actually. When I uh, sort of got in and, and did the research, um, uh, analysts uh, su such as your colleagues uh, bu build this market as about a ten billion dollar market today, uh, growing by about twenty three percent per year, so to about one hundred and twenty five billion by uh, by the end of the the decade here. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of winners here, and uh, and there's an enormous amount of people that are looking at uh, bringing stem cells or uh, uh, bringing cells, stem cells to uh, to tissue sites, uh, bringing uh, uh, modified proteins, uh, and as we spoke about chemotherapeutic agents or other bio, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, to the destination, they all suffer from the same vexing problem. How do you get them to stay? Uh, to stay in the uh, in where you want them to stay for a period of time, uh, and that's where I think we can come in, 
and uh, and Kytogenics can uh, can uh, can essentially build a portfolio of licenses for these individual uh, areas. And what's cool about the surgery world is a colorectal surgeon doesn't do brain surgery. Uh, and, uh, and so you can actually segment these, uh, these uh, indications in a way that allows you to get uh, a licensing fee uh, for each of these indications and potentially uh, with several companies. Uh, so our strategy is is uh, is really to complete uh, this phase two work uh, and then um, license this for the orthopedic indications and then look at the different verticals that we're uh, that we're uh, that we're targeting and find uh, and find other partners uh, to be able to build this. So that's how we want to build the value for our uh, for our shareholders. Sounds like you have a lot on your plate. Um, separate from your clinical and partner uh, programs, you also recently announced plans to investigate a commercial revenue opportunity for developing your own medical grade Kytosan. Uh, how big a market opportunity is this? And can you give us a little detail about this potential revenue driver? So uh, what's the old saying? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, so uh, here, you know, we're not in a we're in a, a period of time where uh, microcap uh, the markets for microcap companies uh, are are not very friendly. Uh, so it occurred to uh, to us and uh, and said, hey, uh, you know, medical kitesan, as I said, medical grade kitesan at the beginning of our discussion, uh, is a 250 million dollar uh, global market. Roughly half of that market is in uh, is in North America. Uh, and uh, and it uh, occurred to Jonathan and I that uh, we actually have a, a, some particularly uh, cool characteristics uh, of, uh, of our Kytosan because it's lyophilized, meaning that it's freeze-dried, essentially. Everybody who drinks freeze-dried coffee, it's, it's sort of you take the, 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 uh, uh, the liquid out and it allows it to be much more stable. And so we have uh, we completed uh, the studies about a month ago uh, that, uh, that sealed its three-year shelf life. And so uh, recognizing that that's probably best in the industry, uh, we think that we could uh, help other pharmaceutical companies who are just looking for the Kytosan component without necessarily the PRP uh, to, uh, to do some projects. Uh, and, uh, and so we identified a manufacturer that could help uh, and we developed the, the GMP, uh, good manufacturing practices uh, process. So that's complete. Uh, and uh, and so uh, we're going to see if we can't uh, sell just the Kytosan on its own. Uh, and from a regulatory standpoint, meaning uh, the uh, the FDA already deem uh, a Kytosan uh, as safe. Uh, so uh, so there's no regulatory process, and ultimately that burden would fall on the partner organization that's that wants to use the Kytosan for whatever implications that they uh, that they use for. Uh, so, uh, so we thought that that uh, would be able to bring a more near-term uh, revenue stream for us uh, to be able to offset uh, some of the uh, some of the costs of of developing the real prize, which is obviously uh, building uh, building the the profile that we discussed uh, before. So that's the that's the strategy there. My uh, what I what I want to do so it's not so distracting in the organization is is to find find a person. Uh, whether uh, male or female, to uh, to who really knows that market really well, and then uh, give them a, a good uh, a good solid uh, base, and then a really big incentive uh, to go and run that business. Uh, and then Jonathan and I will focus uh, focus on the the continued development, and have he or she uh, really drive uh, the the kite design market. Uh, that's uh, that's not uh, my expertise, but uh, there are lots of people. It's a large market, and there are lots of people that might be able to help us to do that. So that's what we're going to do. Excellent, Phil. Excellent indeed. Um, thank you for taking time for this interview today. Uh, we appreciate your insights on the company and we look forward to continued company progress. Uh, we wish you the best indeed. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. It's uh, always a pleasure to speak about, but even uh, even cooler that uh, we're going to be able to help uh, many, many people be open with our technology. Talk soon. Thank you for joining us for this C-Suite interview presentation brought to you by Channel Check. View our YouTube channel for more video content, including C-Suite interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.